Hello, today we're going to start our study of Romeo and Juliet and Shakespeare. Before we can get started on our presentation, I need you to go over to your Google Classroom or to my website and download the following activities. You're going to need the Intro to Shakespeare guide as well as the Plot Guided Notes, okay? And that's in the Act 1 folder. So, as I go through this presentation, I'd like you to fill out the Intro to Shakespeare guide. And then as soon as that's done, I'll have you flip over to the plot guided notes and fill in the notes there. Okay. So with that said, let's go through our presentation really quick. All right. What I have here is um, the do now. So before we get started, I would like you to complete the first three questions on your worksheet on the guided notes. And the first one is, what do you know about Shakespeare? Right. Everything that you know about Shakespeare. The second column asks you about uh, what do you want to know about Shakespeare? And then finally, what makes you nervous about reading Shakespeare? Take a moment, pause the video, and gather your thoughts and record them. Now that you've done that, let's look at Shakespeare. You may be thinking, Shake who? Probably you've heard of him, but if you haven't, I'll give you a little bit of background. He lived from 1564 to 1616. He was an English playwright, poet, and actor. He wrote 38 plays and over 100 poems. He acted on stage and owned his own theater company and theater. He is from England, and he was born on Stratford-upon-Avon and England's Avon River. So right where the star is, kind of right by London. <clears throat> so you may be wondering what the life and times of Shakespeare was like. Basically, 16th century life was hard. There's no electricity, no cars, no telephones, no grocery stores, no malls or TV. And most people could not read. Also, it was dirty. Most people never bathed or brushed their teeth. Roads were made of dirt and people traveled by horseback. You can see a picture here of a house here and they were made of wood and thus things were very flammable. Everything was made of wood, and there was no indoor lights or heating stove, so there was lots of fires. Think about people using candles and, and heaters inside with wood fire, and it just basically happened to be that a lot of times things would burn down. Also, um, you had to be careful where you stepped because people would empty their chamber pots right onto the street. This is where the practice of men walking towards the outside of the, or closest to the the street and men walk or women walking on the inside came from because hopefully if you were being escorted by a fine gentleman and you're a lovely young woman they get splashed with excrement not you well hopefully nobody gets splashed but if somebody's gonna get splashed it's hopefully not your your lady yeah things were never dull um elizabethan entertainment included wars here's an image of queen elizabeth she's so beautiful don't you think and um it's, this is called the Elizabethan era because she was the queen during the time. But like I said, she, she was constantly at war. There was plague. You guys have probably heard of the Black Death or the Black Plague. This took out a third of Europe's population and was really devastating. As you guys uh, have probably heard at some point or another, the plague was carried by fleas that was carried on rats. So um, a really nasty... Uh, ailment. If you ever heard Ring Around the Rosie, uh, I encourage you to consider the lyrics again because it's actually describing the Black Death. So um, look at it again. Really, a lot of our children's stories and songs have really sinister backgrounds. Uh, also, there was royal scandals, not unlike today. Uh, people like to follow what the monarchy is doing. Um, they had witch hunts. And unfortunately, a lot of innocent people were probably put to death because they were accused of being witch, witches. One of um, the most notable trials I know of is uh, they would throw people into the river, and if they could swim, they were a witch and thus had to be killed. If they sank, God bless them, they were good Christian souls, and they're going to be in heaven now, but you still died. Either way, you died. So that sucks. Um, gambling, prostitution, narcotics were also forms of entertainment, and of course, the theater. And that's where we're going to talk about more. 
Also, Queen Elizabeth I never married. A fun fact. Uh, she ruled England for 60 years by herself. She's known as the Virgin Queen. And um, she basically was a really unique leader in that she was a female monarch for so long. Um, you can see her styling here, too. Uh, it was very popular to have cinch in waist. So uh, corsets were torn, uh, pulled really tight. Also, to be very pale was really an attractive feature because of the fact that it kind of showed that you were not a common laborer. You didn't have to go into the sun to make your living. And also, having a high forehead was also really attractive. So women would actually shave and pluck their hair so that they would have an extra high forehead. Um, this is probably a really nice rendition of what Queen Elizabeth looked like. She probably had a lot of uh, scars from... Um, different ailments that she faced in her earlier youth and was probably kind of unsightly. But back to the theater. The theater had no lights or microphones, uh, no sets. In the theater, we had uh, plays such as comedies, tragedies, and histories. That's what Shakespeare primarily put out. And only male actors, which a lot of people are shocked to hear. It was considered um, a male profession, and for women to do it would be a vulgar thing. Uh, the, you may be wondering who played the girl parts then. Well, I'll get to that in a moment. The Globe Theater was, uh, this is actually an image of the Globe Theater from the inside, an artistic depiction. But Shakespeare started as an actor and eventually came to lead his own acting crew and his own theater, The Globe, which is actually still around today, despite it being, uh, you know, destroyed a couple times by fire. And you can actually still go to The Globe Theater and see uh, renditions of uh, Shakespeare plays. Pretty cool. Uh, this is another image of The Globe Theater. You can see it's a chart with all, um, lots of different parts. You can pause the video and look more in depth at pictures, or you can even Google pictures on your own and see what The Globe Theater looked like back then and what it looks like today. As you can see, it has an open here uh, roof because, uh, again, no electricity plays had to be done in the daytime. Um, acting groups went around the country to perform wherever they could. And they commonly consisted of three or four men and a boy. And again, boy play, boys played the women's roles. They had to overact, making exaggerated gestures with their arms and hands. And if you really think about it, they had to do that because of the fact there was no microphones. And also, people were probably shouting and interrupting the play. Um, once you read Shakespeare, you'll see he's really into dramatic irony. And so I can only imagine that the audience is shouting at the characters to not do something or not go somewhere or not trust that person. Because they, the audience, know things that the characters on the stage do not. Dramatic irony. All right, so those are our notes for the first guided notes that I mentioned on the uh, Google Doc. What I'd like you to go to is your drama Google Doc, and on that Google Doc, we're going to talk about drama, drama, drama. I'll give you a moment to get the, that opened up. Now, drama is tension. In theater, tension means that the audience is expecting something to happen between the characters. Will they shoot each other? Will they finally confess their undying love for one another? Will they forgive? This is the heart of every great show, book, film, um, play. If there is no tension, there is no drama. Again, as I mentioned before, Shakespeare had three main genres. He broke up um, them into comedies, tragedies, and histories. And Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy. As you guys have likely heard, because most people have heard at least a little bit about Romeo and Juliet, Romeo and Juliet die at the end of our play, and hence this would be considered a tragedy. Tragedies are serious um, and have important actions that end unhappily, and it usually ends with the deaths of the main characters. Again, spoiler alert, Romeo and Juliet die. If you didn't know that yet, you will as soon as you read the prologue because they tell you in the first, you know, three minutes of the play that they die at the end of the play. Comedies um, are another type of genre that Shakespeare wrote about. Um, they are not always very funny, but they usually end with the marriage of the main couple and they look forward to the future. This image is uh, one of the ballet for A Midsummer's Night Dream. And Mi A Midsummer's Night Dream is a classic example of a comedy written by Shakespeare. Histories 
um, are another type of genre that Shakespeare wrote about. These usually deal with actual events, and they end in whatever way is historically factual. And they're used to stimulate the imagination. Sometimes, um, it's kind of interesting, Shakespeare's words get connected to the very event itself. Here we have a depiction of uh, Caesar, Julius Caesar's uh, death from the stabbings of all the senators in the Capitol, which really did happen in Roman history. But Shakespeare wrote a play, Julius Caesar, and his famous lines, et tu, Brute, have become kind of connected to the event itself, even though Shakespeare is writing about it much later than it actually happened. We don't know if, you know, um, Julius Caesar really said this. Okay, just some kind of general information about Shakespeare plays. All Shakespeare plays have a five-act structure. And if you're unfamiliar with an act, it's basically like a chapter in a story or a novel. Act 1 typically deals with the exposition. And as you guys know, exposition introduces the main characters and their conflicts, establishing the setting. Act 2 is often rising action. And during rising actions, uh, complications occur when main characters try to resolve their conflict. Act 3, we see our crisis or turning point. And main characters uh, make choices that determine the rest of the play. Act 4 is uh, falling action. During the falling action, consequences of crisis are shown that pushes main characters deeper into disaster. Act 5 is climax and resolution, or uh, denouement, right? During this uh, Act 5, moment of the, the moment of greatest tension occurs, and usually there's the death of the tragic hero, and uh, the resolution ties up loose ends. Something else to be aware of while reading Romeo and Juliet, or any play for that matter, are stage directions. Stage directions are the director's intended movement of the actors in the play. They help the readers visualize actions being performed, and they tell the actor where to stand, how to move, and the way to say their lines. In Romeo and Juliet, there are not a lot of stage directions, but it's important to pay attention to when there are stage directions, because really important stuff happens, like somebody gets stabbed or dies, and if you didn't read that stage direction, you'd probably be clueless, clueless as to what happened to that uh, actor. And you'll see that stage directions are typically italicized, and it should be pretty obvious that it's a stage direction. It'll, it'll say, you know, Tybalt and uh, Romeo fight. Uh, classically, stage directions might uh, give where to stand on a particular uh, uh, moment in time during the play. And you'll see here um, is kind of the labels of the stage. So you might hear a director say, you know, actor moves from downstage left to upstage right. And that means they would go across the whole span of the stage. Again, you will not necessarily see that in Romeo and Juliet because the stage directions are limited, but you will classically see that in other plays. All right. Um, why should I care? I can't really answer that question for you. Um, I mean, I could, but I don't want to because I want you to think about it. I know why I care about Shakespeare. I love teaching Shakespeare and I love reading Shakespeare. I've read Romeo and Juliet probably a hundred times, and yet I always glean some new meaning or find some cool new fact that I didn't realize before. So it's something that definitely, after all these years, keeps me guessing. But I'm hoping by the end of this unit, or module, you will have a good answer to this question. Now that you've had your introduction to the stage and Shakespeare and his life and times, I want you guys to look at the prologue, which we'll come back to in a moment. And also I'm going to have you guys participate in a tea party. So this requires the whole class. Uh, your teacher will assign you a certain character from the play and you have to go around and fill out your introduction form and try to figure out how these people might meet up later in the play. Okay, so if you look at the introduction of the Tea Party, it says, Welcome to Fair Verona, a small dysfunctional city in Italy where we lay our scene. The streets of Verona are rife with crime. Two rival families are caught in a murderous all-out smackdown. The Montagues and the Capulets just can't seem to keep from killing each other and anybody else who gets caught in the middle. So it's important that you, dear reader, get the lay of the land. Have fun in your Tea Party. Meet as many people as you can. Remember, you only have two minutes, so speed is of the essence. And don't be afraid to get it wrong. I hope you've enjoyed this video and learned some things, and I'm so excited for you to read Shakespeare. 
I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. Thanks for listening.